I would propose to you that you've had an experience or two in your life that just changed everything. For example, if you're married, hopefully when you got married, things changed in your life. A little shift here and there, some changes. You know, when my wife and I got married, the earth moved, the skies opened up, my world was turned upside down. For the first time, I had somebody to love and protect, and there's... You know, there's some things that really just different after marriage, things that you didn't know about before marriage. I soon discovered that any time I ordered a meal, I thought that was my food. And apparently my order is her order, you know, and anybody that's married knows you're just kind of looking around the table and thinking, you know what? I'm glad they ordered that because I wanted that too. <laughs> Something else that changes everything is the birth of a child. How I many have children in the room? You got two people that claim to have children in the room. We've got a lot of orphans next door, apparently. An entire building full of orphans. That was awkward. How many of you guys have children in the room? All right. Oh, wow. Y'all are like, it's Easter. We don't have kids on Easter. Kids change everything. Everything's different afterwards. I remember when, when my, our, our son was, was born and I held him for the first time, I discovered a new kind of love. It was so intense that I felt like it was a superpower. Do anybody know that feeling? But everything changed. Like before having a child, there was this, there was this thing called privacy. And I know, I know I'm not the only one that's done this. Then you, when, you're, when you just have a, you know, these new children in the house and you're there, you just want a few moments alone. And I can't be the only one that's gone and found the only place in the house that you feel safe. And that's the bathroom. And you lock the door of the bathroom and you're like, finally, I can think for two seconds. But if you're, <laughs> there's no way I'm the only one on this one. If, tell me I'm not alone, that you're in there. And then a few moments later, you see little fingers under the door. <laughs> Come on. It's like. You thought you could hide. <laughs> Things change. Different, different areas of your life come together and just everything seems to be different. And we've all had these experiences and we can look back in these moments and we're thinking, you know what? I was never the same after that, whatever that was. I didn't see things the same. I didn't think the same. And many Many uh, have those kinds of moments. They could be funny or they could be fun or sometimes they could be painful in our life. And you look back in those moments and you're like, you know what, that stole something from me. It robbed some of my innocence from me. I've never been the same since that moment. So it could be good or it could be bad. We've all had some experience that changed everything. Can I get an amen? amen. I want to show you today that the resurrection changed everything. History has forever been changed after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It changed civilizations. And more importantly, it's changed people. It changed the people in this room. Easter has for thousands of years been changing people, billions of people around the world, billions of people around the world today will gather to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the resurrection has transformation power. There's nothing like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more powerful than what you and I are celebrating today. The resurrection makes the weak strong. It makes the prideful humble. It transforms the broken into healed and deserts of despair into gardens of hope. It turns the night of sorrow into a dawn of joy and the shadow of death into light of life. The resurrection is proof that with God, impossibilities can become realities. Resurrection power can turn what appears to be dead and done into a victory won. There's nothing more powerful than the resurrection power. So I want to talk to you today about two people in Scripture whose life was forever changed after Jesus came out of the grave. So there's, there's this 40-day gap between when Jesus walks out of the tomb and when he ascends into heaven, you guys got it? Everybody say 40 days. 40 days. Over those 40 days, he makes 11 appearances. Now, the first person that he appears to is a woman called Mary Magdalene. And we're going to look at John chapter 20, verses 11 through 16. I'll give you a moment. If you have your word, you can look, look at that, and then we'll read it together. It'll be on the screen behind me. We'll start with verse number 11. 
Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Verse 13, dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. Verse 14, she turned to leave and, and saw a, someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Everybody say the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you, you have put him and I will go get him. Verse 16, Mary, Jesus said. See, she recognized the way he said her name. She turned to him and cried out, Rabbanai. See, that's an Aramaic word that, that means my teacher. It means my master. I want to go back and I want to go just look at her story a little bit so we can understand who she is. When Mary first encountered Jesus, the Bible tells us that she's full of evil spirits. And of course, Jesus ain't scared. He ain't worried about that. Demons tremble at even the mention of his name. He says, bring it on. So he, he casts them out. He gives them their eviction notice. And for the first time in a long time, Mary is free. Can I stop to tell you today that Jesus didn't come and die on the cross and rise from the grave just to give you a ticket to heaven? It's not just about someday you're going to end up in heaven. It's not just about someday that hopefully that he'll do all of this so you'll spend eternity in heaven. No, no, no. He wants you to have freedom in the here and now. He wants it to be that you live a life of happiness and joy and peace where you live right now. It's not just about maybe living for eternity somewhere else. He doesn't want you to live in bondage where you're at even today. Can I get an amen, somebody? My Bible says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Everybody say indeed. indeed. There's some prisoners that escaped from a New York prison several years ago, and I think many of you will remember, remember this story. They were, they were on the run, and all these different agencies were, were trying to track them down. They were trying to find them. And these men, the men were free now. They were out of prison. You got the picture? They were no longer being told when to sleep or where to sleep. They, didn't, they weren't told when to get up or when to eat or what to wear. They just, they were free. But when the authorities finally found them, they were exhausted. They were dehydrated. They had constantly been looking over their shoulder. And I want you to get this. They were afraid that their past would catch up to their present and affect their future. Listen, somebody here has been worried that their past was going to catch up to their present. And you've been trying to outrun it, but you can never outrun what's not under the blood. I'm trying to tell you today, there's a big difference between being free and being free indeed. Because when I'm free indeed, I don't have to look over my shoulder. I don't have to live with the burden of guilt. I don't have to wear the shame of my past. My past is in the past where it belongs. Because when I'm free indeed, I don't have to worry about my yesterday affecting my tomorrow because it's under the blood. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise for being free indeed today. So he set Mary free. She's free now. I want you to imagine how Mary's feeling. She's feeling peace, finally. She's finally experiencing joy because, because of him. Her life is finally being, it's been radically changed and transformed by this man named Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. And now he's dead. On top of that, the grave is empty. Think about how Mary's feeling. Now I want you to, I'd like to paint these, we like to think of these biblical characters sometimes as superheroes of faith. Many of them are, they did some amazing things, but they were human beings like you and I. They did, they experienced stuff just like we do. So that morning, whenever Mary showed up at the tomb, she saw, she saw that this tomb was empty and she had some feelings like you and I would have. She went back and she said, went back to tell Simon Peter and the other disciples that the tomb is empty. <laughs> but get this, she didn't come back saying, guess what? 
He was telling the truth. He rose from the grave just like he said he would. No, no, no. What'd she do? She comes back. She's like, somebody's taking the body. Everybody panic. Freak out. That's what's happening. She's like, you know, it's not, it's not so in kind of peace. And like, man, I told you, God did it. He raised himself from the grave. It's amazing. You know, no, she's like, just freak out, everybody. There's somebody took the baby, took, took, took the body, and I don't know what to do about it. The disciples are like, oh, no, uh they like, they're, you know, they, they're ready. They just jumped up. I mean, these are some rough dudes, some of them, that God turned their life around. But they still, they were still men. They were like, oh, no, uh Somebody took that body. So immediately... They're ready to get, they put their running sandals on. Here, let's look at verse number three. <laughs> they put their Crocs in sport mode. Y'all know about that. <laughs> I don't have Crocs, but they, you know, I hear they're cool. They don't look cool, but I hear they're cool. Look at, look at, uh, look at verse number three, Peter and the other disciple, that's John that's writing this, okay? So he's referring to himself as the other disciple. So Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. Now, this part is hilarious to me, okay? I want to take this picture for you, verse number four. They were both running, but the other disciple, that's John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So what John's like, all right, Pete, why are you so slow, bro? <laughs> and guess what? I'm going to put it in the Bible that you were out of shape and couldn't run very fast for thousands of years. Billions of people are going to know that you're slow and I'm fast. I love that he just included that in there, right? He's like, eventually Peter showed up. So Mary comes back to the tomb and I want you to notice I want, you know, cause she's there too. She, she comes, you know, along there, but they, they, I just, I think it's kind of interesting to note that, that John doesn't mention that he's faster than Mary here. And I'm just going to say, because he knew that men shouldn't be competing in women's sports, but that's just something else. I'm sorry. I'm going to take a drink of water. Uh Oh, he done messed up now. I'm going to be on the news. All right, so Mary's in the garden. She's near the tomb, and this is where she encounters Jesus, okay? And I want you to get the picture. She's, she's at the grave, but she's not full of faith. She's full of heartbreak. And I, and I, want you to, and I wonder if you've ever been to this place before where she's at, where you've, you've expected something and you were hoping for something, but in reality, you've got a heart that is breaking and that feeling that all hope is evaporated from your body. I'm getting real with you for just a moment. All hope is gone. That experience where you get the phone call or you got the news or you find out something that you didn't want to find out or you had this experience that just hurts so much that, that you feel like if you breathe out, you'll never be able to breathe back in again. Mary wasn't just crying. She was weeping. It was an ugly cry. It was the cry where your heart is breaking. It hurts. It's dark. It's miserable. Mary's at the grave of heartbreak. Everybody say the grave of heartbreak. Grave of heartbreak. And if I had to guess, some of you have been there. Some of you are there right now. But I hear, here's, here's what we're learning, you know, about all of this is that, that, all of us find this experience some point in our life that we say, God, I, I'm, I'm here and, I'm, and I'm, I, I really was hoping for this or that. And, and, and I thought that maybe I was going to be okay, but then I found out I'm more weak than I thought I was because there's these broken relationships that we have. And then the person says they were going to be there to have and to hold until death do us part, but they walked out. And it's the child that won't be at lunch today because you haven't talked to them in months. And it's the friend that stabbed you in the back and, it, and, and it's never been right since. And some of you have been to the grave of broken dreams and, and you thought that things would be different and you thought you'd be in a different place than you are right now at a different point in your life and you thought maybe you'd be married by now. You thought maybe you'd have kids by now. You thought maybe that you'd be in a different place financially or your career by now and you, you just didn't think you'd be dealing with these issues and over and over again. And it's just this grave of broken dreams. Or maybe it's the grave of emotional weariness. 
And I, don't, I, I, I don't, didn't think maybe that I would be dealing with this anxiety right now. I didn't think that, that I'd be dealing with depression. I didn't think I would have an unexplainable weight that is hitting me out of nowhere. Somebody's been there before. And here's the danger of the grave of heartbreak. What was supposed to be a place that you visited can become a place where you set up residence. You learn to function at the grave. You learn how to deal with it. You learn how to just kind of get through life. But, but, but you're not just living a life that's alive at that point. You're just trying to survive. And you're not living a life that's full of joy and peace and passion and purpose. And you're not living with the goodness of God. You're living trying to just exist at this grave of heartbreak. And when you've set up residence at the grave, your mind tells you this is just my lot in life. I'm talking to somebody today. This is just where I'm going to live. This is just the way I guess my life has to be. This is the disappointment that I need to just learn to live with. And I've come to tell somebody today, that's not what Jesus wants for you. He's got more for you. He's got plans for you. And he doesn't want you to just settle for the little things. He says, I want you to learn not just to survive, but how to thrive. Somebody say, I'm ready for more. So Jesus shows up to Mary at the graveside garden and she's weeping not expecting resurrection not expecting anything better you hear me it's not what she was expecting she wasn't expecting anything better she came prepared to grieve it's where she had learned to live and as her savior is there she but he's there but she thinks he's just the gardener he's right there beside her and i and i think about this for a moment every now and then and I was I read this scripture and it kind of stands out to me because this is a man that she has followed for years. It's a man that she knows. It's a man that she's been around many times. She's heard him speak so many times. But somehow when she meets him and they're near each other together, she thinks he's the gardener. It's because heartbreak can so blind you that you can't see God right in front of you. Some of you today have been wondering where God is. And I'm here to tell you that God has been right there all along. Because he's a friend to the brokenhearted. Because he's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. And whether you wanted anything to do with him or not, I promise you this. He's always wanted everything to do with you. He says, I'm always here. Don't you worry. Even though you don't see me, even though you don't know it, uh, I want you to know I'm here and I'm here to take care of you. The word says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Here's some good news for somebody today. If what you've got is too heavy to carry, you just need to know that you've got a God that wants to show himself strong for you. He's looking for an opportunity to show himself strong for you. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to cry for it. You don't have to say, God, one day I hope maybe you'll show up. He's looking for you. All he wants for you to do is surrender your weakness and he will say, I will show myself strong for you. And watch this. All Jesus had to do was just say her name. In the very moment that his voice formed the sound of her name, hope flooded back into her soul. She just had to hear her name. And some of you, have, you feel forgotten. Some of you feel looked over. Some of you feel broken and neglected. And I'm trying to tell you that Jesus knows your name today. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't neglecting your situation. He's calling out your name. Somebody needs to just listen and say, God, I hear you. I'm in the garden with you. And I'm ready for you to speak my name, to just reassure me that you've been here all along. And whatever I'm carrying, I don't have to carry carry it by myself. There's one more person I want to show you today. The resurrection changed everything for Peter. Everybody say Peter. Peter. Some of y'all, y'all won't understand this, but, but Peter had a little hood in him. <laughs> Peter was from the streets. Peter's, Peter was three quarters Christian, one quarter gangster. 
Y'all need to read your Bible if you don't understand that one, because, man, I'm going to tell you, Peter had it in him. You won't mess with Peter. I think, I was thinking about it. I think the reason that John beat Peter back to the tomb was Peter had to go back for his knife. You know, Peter's like, hold on. Hold on a second. I, I, we, we about to fight somebody. He would already cut somebody's ear off for Jesus. He ain't, he ain't worried. He had to go. He was strapped. But here's the context I want you to understand. Peter is a fisherman, okay? And, and, and Jesus comes up to him and he says, Peter, come follow me and I'll make you fisher of men. And so Jesus uses this metaphor that Peter would understand as a fisherman. I want you to, I want you to understand why he would do that. It's because Jesus always meets you at the place of your need. He comes to where you're at. He makes sure and you understands you so you can grasp in your mind that he sees you for who you are. So Jesus uses this metaphor and then he says, okay, let's go. Peter's like, John, I'm in it. You don't have to say it twice. Some of y'all know somebody like Peter, where they just like act first, you know, think later. <laughs> just let's go. And he's full of passion. He's got fire, this Peter guy. He's on it. And then, and then here comes the trial of Jesus, and the Messiah is accused of all these things that he didn't do. And the rest of the disciples, they've scattered. There's chaos, and there's, there's confusion. They don't know what to do. Everything's just kind of in mayhem at that point in time. Not Pete. He finds himself following close behind. And while he's in this courtyard trying to be inconspicuous, it's a courtyard there. It's all within the same. It's all, all within ear you know, shot of, you know, right of each other. They're close by, and he's over there, and he's, he can see this, and he sees what's going on there. And he's trying to be inconspicuous, kind of watching Jesus, seeing what's, what's happening. And this little girl comes up to Peter, and she's like, aren't you with the Nazarene over there? He's like, no, I'm not. And this is where Peter denies him three times. And I, I think this is the most painful moment in Peter's life, in my opinion, because it, it, it was right after the third time the scripture says that Jesus looked up at Peter when he denied him. He looked at him. And I want you to imagine the overwhelming shame that came over Peter in that moment. Seriously, get your mind in this moment for just a second. The shame that would have come over Peter when as soon as he denies knowing him, Jesus and Peter lock eyes. They see it. They, he knows Jesus heard him. He's thinking, no way I've just done this. But it happened in that moment and the shame that comes over him. And he has to be thinking, I've blown it. I've ruined it. I've just, I've thrown it all away. Everything that I was, I was hoping for, this relationship that I was building, these dreams that we were talking about together, me and Jesus. And then here, I've blown it. And I think a few of us in this room have felt that way a time or two. So Peter goes back to fishing. He goes back to the very thing that Jesus called him out of. And he goes back to the thing that will always, it's, we all do this, go back to the things that make us comfortable. The things that we know, the things that we're used to do, the things that we're just kind of can do without having to think much about it. And, and I want you to know that God is always trying to call you out of comfort and into greater and greater things. And the enemy's always trying to push you back into comfort. God's saying, if you'll come out of what you think makes you comfortable, I'll wrap my comforting arms around you and take you to places you've never dreamed of. But you've got to trust me to come out of what you find secure and walk into the secured arms of God Almighty. I'm trying to talk to somebody today. We've been wanting to go back to what we used to do, how we used to do it, how we used to say it and think, and God's saying, come over to me out of your comfort zone and watch and see what I can't do with your life. See, that's what shame does. Shame wants us to go back. It wants us to isolate so immediately when I see somebody start to isolate, shame most of the time is the root of it. Shame. I don't want to isolate and to get away. And immediately I'm thinking, no, 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 there's good times to be away, but many times it's good to be among the body of Christ. It's good to be around family. It's good to be around friends. We shouldn't be isolated. But that's what we're wanting to do. Just get a get back. Because shame wants us to freeze. It wants us to run back to the place that we know, the place that we're comfortable with. So Peter is out there doing what he used to do, and that's fish. And Jesus comes along on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he calls out to these guys. He says, hey, 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 y'all catch anything? How's the fishing? Soon after, John's like, hey, wait a second, that's Jesus talking. 
And Peter, what's he do? Act now, think later. He jumps out of the boat. Perfectly good boat. Could row over there if you wanted to. He just jumps straight out of the boat, starts swimming to shore. And, he's, he, and, and, and I think this is phenomenal because like, he gets there, and guess who's there waiting on him? Jesus, the one that he betrayed. But not only this, this is great. Not only is he Jesus there, but Jesus has made up this nice hot breakfast for him. Jesus cooked him food. So they're there, they eat together. Chef Jesus and St. Pete eating together <laughs> right there on the shore. I never knew, I never really thought about the fact that Jesus was a cook, you know what I'm saying? But apparently, I mean, he created, you know, he knows what's up. He knows what to put together and what not to. I mean, he's like, yeah, this fish will go with that perfectly. Let me just get it the perfect temperature by touching it. <laughs> and then Jesus has this conversation with him. And I think it's the most crit critical conversation in the life of Peter, verse number 15. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon John, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Now, now when you read that, it doesn't seem that important. You know, it's like, why is that a big deal? You know, Jesus says, I love you. Then Peter says, I love you back. And it just sounds like a pretty normal conversation. Well, in English, uh, it seems like a basic conversation. It seems more basic than it is, but your New Testament was originally written in the Greek language, and the Greek language has four words for love, and it is a more expressive and more colorful language than ours. It's a, our English is a very limited language, and so Jesus was saying to him, he said, hey, Peter, do you have agape love for me? Do you agape me? And the word agape means unconditional love. And I want you to get this. This is where I'm bringing the whole sermon to here. I want you to understand this is an unconditional love. It's, it's, it's a, it doesn't matter your behavior. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter where you've been. It's the kind of love that God has for us is agape love. But then listen, Peter responds by saying, well, you know that I phileo you. See, phileo is brotherly love. That's where you get Philadelphia from. That's the city of brotherly love. That's what that word means, phileo. So he says, you know that I phileo you. So watch this. Jesus asked him, do you agape me? And Peter's saying, I love you, but I just don't, I don't think we're at that level. And it's, it's not that Peter doesn't love him. Now, this is where it, we, there's so many of us can identify with this. It's not that Peter doesn't love him. He just doesn't know that he's at that level right now. In verse number 16, and, 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 and Jesus, and again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? And, and then he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And the Lord said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. But here's what's very interesting. The third go around, Jesus changes his word. And he says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter says, you know, I phileo you. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, he says all this. He says this to each and every one of us. And that's in this room. Jesus was going, you know what? All right, Peter, if you're not there yet, if you're not where I was hoping you'd be, if you're not at that agape love, if you're not there yet, I'm okay with that. And I'm so okay with it that I'm going to come down and I'm going to meet you at the level where you are. So if all you've got is phileo love for me right now, I'm trying to assure you that's okay. And I'm going to come meet you where you are. And Peter has to be thinking, come on, God, how you could? No, what really? How is this happening? The weren't you there in the courtyard? I know you heard me. I know you. Didn't you see me? Didn't you hear me? I, oh, I know that you looked at me in that moment. You know I don't have agape for you, God. You know, you know I don't have unconditional love because I proved it in the courtyard. And you're asking me this and I'm having to tell you that if I'm being honest, it's not agape love because unconditional love means I wouldn't have betrayed you. I do love you, but I'm not there yet. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's sitting there on that seashore and he's like, all right, it's okay, Peter. I've come to meet you where you're at. It's okay, Mary. You don't have to recognize me. I'm here. 
The resurrection changes everything. And he's trying to tell somebody today that no stone can keep him away from you. He's coming to meet you where you are. There's no heartache too deep that he can't reach it. There's no shame so overwhelming that you can't come home today. And there's nothing that you've taught. There's nothing that you've said or experienced or done that can put you outside of the reach of God's mercy. Jesus lived a perfect sinless life. And he died the death that you and I deserve. He paid the penalty for our sin. Listen, and he willingly laid down his life as a sacred exchange. His anguish for our peace. His blood for our freedom. His stripes for our healing. Yes, we celebrate the resurrection today, but it's part of a bigger picture. There was something else that happened in this week, 2,000 plus years ago. There was a crucifixion. There was a brutal scene. All of that was an exchange for your life. All of that was an exchange for your peace and freedom and healing. And he says, hey, I'm going to die, but the good news is I'm not going to stay dead. He defeated death to show us that he can do what we can't do. There's nothing too hard for our God. God. There's nothing too difficult for him to do. And none of us are too far gone for us to reach, be reached by his loving hand. You don't have to wait to get everything right. He's ready to meet you where you are today. Jesus is the gardener in the garden and he's the chef on the shore. And no matter where you are, he's calling your name today.